Folks, welcome to another Network-Centric Resources online discussion. This series features resource designers sharing hard-earned knowledge and lesson learned. So I'm your host, Dirk Slater. I'm the Fab Writer in Fab Writers. We build tech and data capacity to strengthen advocacy and humanitarian efforts. Our Network-Centric Resources project aims to learn from those that are developing people-powered and participatory knowledge assets by comparing methodologies for sharing ownership, enabling contribution, and supporting collaboration. Our past online discussions have focused on developing content with and for communities and networks, such as Heather Leeson on curating data literacy social learning curriculum with humanitarians for IFRC's data playbook, uh, Greg Bloom, on co-creating data standards with health and human service providers through his organization, Open Referral, and Sarah Allen on designing MozFest, an event that replicates a healthy internet by getting 2,000 people under one roof collaborating. I point out to all of our online discussions guests as exemplifying facilitative leadership in some form of the nut or another. Now, joining me today is Alan Gunn, AKA Gunner, Gunner is actually the common thread through this online discussion series. Um, not only has he helped me conceive the Network Centric Resources Project, he's also provided most of our guest speakers with advice and guidance. He is the Executive Director of Aspiration, an organization that connects nonprofit organizations, foundations, and activists with software solutions and technology skills that help them carry out their missions. Over Aspiration's history and well before that, Gunner has worked tirelessly to support and develop facilitative leadership. He's also a long-term collaborator and friend. Gunner, Gunner, how are you doing today? Dirk, Dirk, I am wonderful. I am so happy to be here and I'm just feeling a certain form of adrenaline over how many new and old friends we have with us. So hello, everybody. It is fabulous. We've got a really good group. Um, so. Let's start off with, with just the, the, the starting point, which is a good uh, definition. What is um, facilitative leadership? Sure, I mean, I think I would say initially that it's a work in progress. In other words, it's a term we've come to use over the years that I feel I have an intuitive sense of, but I think part of facilitative leadership is not assuming you know everything. And so I think if I were to say what it means to me, facilitative leadership to me is a focus on helping to achieve collective accomplishment and collective outcome rather than a focus on individual control dynamics. I think traditional, traditional leadership is the act of telling people what to do or asserting power. I think facilitative leadership is designing systems that allow everyone to accomplish collectively a goal or goals as they see fit, whether that is an event where everyone's trying to learn and collaborate or whether that is a project where people are trying to ship a piece of technology or produce a body of, of content. Um, to do that, I think facilitative leadership centers on finding ways to grant agency and equity to all the stakeholders in what I would call sustainable measure. I think a part of facilitative leadership is you want everyone to have agency and equity, but you want to make sure that agency and equity is earned. Because I think too often in quote unquote open leadership, uh, there are those who have not contributed or those who have not, shall we say, brought the love that can sidetrack processes by creating noise or creating division uh, without having really established that they're there for the collective, without having established that they are there for uh, the betterment of the larger uh, group and the larger goal. And so, so much of what facilitative leadership, in our opinion, is uh, centers around balancing power dynamics, where as a facilitative leader, you seek to identify others in a group. That can be in a room, at an event, in a project, online, offline, but find others that also are focused on collective outcomes. People that are thinking about what is best for the group, people who are thinking about collective goals, move power to those people. We call them facilitators when we run events and move power away from anyone who's trying to take individual control. Anybody who's asserting their right, anyone who says they're smartest, anyone who assumes they've got a right to talk the most, Facilitative leadership is about subverting those people and about taking their power away because in claiming their power, they are taking away power from others. And so facilitative leadership is that idea of balancing power so that agency and, equi agency and autonomy are granted equitably to a group, to a network, to a set of people in order to overall achieve your collective outcomes. So um, 
how would you how actually i think you've just given some good you know some good stuff in terms of how you know it when you see it that whole thing of like you know being able to uh um identify the collective um uh, not having those that are trying to be more individualistic um but uh i i um i'm i'm wondering about like in terms of hierarchies and things like that like how do you uh how do you operate uh in a way that you can um i mean is it i i guess sorry is it about subverting the hierarchy is what i'm trying to get at for this, or is it about breaking it down? You know, it's a good question. I'm not sure I think about it quite those ways. I think it's about subverting power dynamics. Hierarchy is one, you know, sort of brittle structure of power dynamics, but power dynamics exist in many ways that are independent of hierarchy. Um, and other forms of sort of shape, privilege and control. Um, I think if I were to talk about traits or core competencies, of facilitative leadership, I tend to focus on three. Um, I think facilitative leadership is about narrative. It's about telling stories that ground a group or a community both in a common language and in a unified sense of purpose. Because I think until you get to that shared language and that shared sense of purpose, it's tough to subvert anything because you are hurting the proverbial kitty cats on some adrenalizing component. And so I think it's really critical to be mindful of your narrative, your storytelling so that what you are doing is bringing a group forward collectively and you're not unilaterally authoring the story you are facilitating a collective co-creation of a narrative but you're setting a frame or putting forth a process and that leads to the second trait that of facilitative leadership to me which is proactive attention to governance what governance structure and i say little g governance because i don't believe in bureaucracy i don't believe in over legislating but what little g governance do you put in place that allows you to be a facilitative leader. And an example I always give from our event work, we have guidelines, participation guidelines, and we have this rule of three that in keeping things inclusive, you should use the simplest language you can use. Don't throw jargon around, don't use passive aggressively complex language. When you speak, make one point in a group of in people, speak one in of the time. To me, those are governance constructs, and they give myself and other facilitators at a live event an ability to modulate people that are trying to take control. If someone's trying to talk over people and mansplain or personsplain, you've got a guideline that says, hey, can you keep this simple and accessible? If you've got someone monologuing, you've got the ability to say, hey, you've spoken more than one nth of the time. You're making more than one point. And so I think good facilitative leadership is about identifying before you get into a process what is the minimum viable governance constructs or what are the minimum viable governance constructs that should be in place that you can reference as what I call your constitutional frame. Because if you're making your rules up on the fly, that's a lot harder to socialize and assert. But if you've got practice in facilitative leadership and have a narrative that asserts that there's some ground rules, then you're winning. You're, you're out ahead of any bad behaviors by basically painting lines on a metaphorical playing field, if I can use that analogy. And then I think the other trait of facilitative leadership is what I describe as negotiation. In other words, I think there's often the term waterfall planning, the idea that you sort of figure out a sequence of things that will happen over a number of months as if you could tell the future. I think facilitative leadership is iterative negotiation. It, negotiation to me is the core concept in facilitative leadership. And it's the idea that with a group that you are trying to be a facilitative leader within, you should have a pattern of ask before you tell, as in find out what the folks you are engaging with are thinking or wanting or prioritizing before you echo back what you think is the useful next step. And by asking before you tell, but then counter proposing, you converge ideally on a best path that, that accomplishes shared agency and shared equity and gets you to your goal, whether that is running a good session at an event or delivering a good network centric resource. It's that sense of having a story that you're telling with governance guidelines that inhibit bad behaviors and encourage good behaviors, while also iteratively negotiating with individuals and with the larger group to converge on a shared plan and a unified outcome. So it is doing that thing, the, the, the three things that I, that I always point to in terms of what a network-centric resource looks like is the ability to 
it, it's doing the sharing ownership, it's the enabling contribution and also supporting collaboration in all ways, shapes or form. And the thing with the small G governance is that's the, the governance is what allows that to happen. And you as a facilitator, you are simply guiding the process, making sure that people are in touch with all of those things and making sure that they know how to have, how it happens. Um, yes. One thing I just, I, I wanna quickly say thank you to, uh, uh, of folks that are making use of the chat room right now to do some note taking, uh, Rachel in particular, and also Beatrice for sharing guidelines and stuff like that. I am really thankful for that because that will very much uh, help me in my job after this discussion of taking notes. So do keep those coming and also um, keep those notes in terms of your own yourself and your own projects and what you're doing and who you are. Thank you so much for that. Um, so Gunnar, um, before we do the small group breakouts, just wondering if you can give us some, some good, clear examples of facilitative leadership. Sure, uh, happy to try. When you asked me for examples, I was like, oh, that's not as easy as one would hope. But I think, let me talk about sort of meta examples. And so I think with events, facilitative leadership to me in live event context, as you know, that is a central passion of my existence. But facilitative leadership to me is, <clears throat> prioritizing collectivism over expertism. And so I think if you think, one of the rants that I go on on a regular basis is that we are raised in three very broken paradigms, education, religion, and pop culture, all condition us to sit down, shut up, face the front of the room, and do whatever we're told. And so we're conditioned from a very early age, do what the teacher says, do what the religious leader says, or do what the pop star says, put your hands in the air like you just don't care. And so there is a sense of expertism or specialness associated with many live convenings. There is a stage, there is a front of the room, there is a panel who are anointed as more worthy than the people that sit in the vast ocean of supplicators of knowledge. And so I think it's really important when you're looking for examples to say in an event context, how is an event designed or how are event leaders behaving in a way that acknowledges that the superset of the knowledge and the valuable experience and the wisdom lies not in any one head that would be placed at the front of a room, but instead lies in the collective. So I think any event that really tries to leverage all brains, as opposed to assuming a very small finite number of often male, often white, often older brains are more special or more equal than others, that to me is facilitative leadership sort of in an events context. I think in open projects, you know, I'm a fan of studying governance and community dynamics in open projects. And I know you're working on the network centric resources, so we've talked a lot about this. Um, it's a little cliche, but I hold up Debian. Debian is a Linux distribution, and I'm privileged to work on the reproducible builds project within Debian. And I'm just really in awe of the fact Debian's been around well over a decade, actually over 15 years, they may be coming up on 20 now. Um, sorry, Debian, for not knowing your age. But the facilitative leadership I see in Debian is that there is a consultative ethic. There are well-defined governance frameworks for saying, hey, we're about to make this decision. Here's where you can give input. Let us know what you think. But what I give Debian, at least the parts of Debian I know, what I give Debian credit for is the leaders understand how to take all input, but filter, echo back out a counter proposal, that negotiation cycle I talk about, and converge on a rough consensus where they're not trying to please everybody. They're understanding that some outliers need to basically be told, hey, sorry, we're not gonna get that in. And in general, they are um, converging on outcomes that feel collectively owned, but in a way that is a sustainable, replicable, scalable process. And I've learned so much watching the Reproducible Builds team at uh, in Debian, Chris Lamb, Holder, Levson, Vagrant, and, and Mattia in particular, watching the way they collectively lead, that there's four of them that co-lead reproducible builds. They have a sense of accountability to their larger community, but they have a sense of agency and authority to move governance forward, to advance the project, but to do it in an utterly transparent, extremely inclusive way, so that at any point in the future, if a question is asked, how did we get here? Who decided that? The answer is we did. And here's the mailing list thread, or here's the wiki page, or here's the document. So it's really a case of, pushing forward, but pushing forward in a way that grants that equity and that inclusion. Those are good examples. I think the final answer to your question is I would say any process where you do in fact ask before you tell is telling you that you're heading toward facilitated leadership. You know, anytime you come into a room knowing what people need, 
that is not facilitated leadership, unless the reason you know what they need coming into the room is because you've already talked to them individually and sussed out a general mandate. Um, I think another way of saying uh, what I think is facilitated leadership, I think of who's on this call right now, and I'm not just saying this, I mean this, I sincerely assume that the collective knowledge of everyone else on this call dwarfs my own when it comes to facilitated leadership, because each of you have facilitated or led or managed in context I've never been in. And so to me, facilitative leadership is that humility of knowing that you have as much to learn as you have to offer in executing your remit as a facilitative leader. I like the privilege of facilitating. I like the privilege of getting to be the one that shapes quality and sets governance. But I think it's critical to do that in a frame that is humble to the fact that you are just lucky to have your hands on the wheel and everybody in the car has a good sense of where we should be going. Um, Gunnar, do you want to say a thing or two about questions now that might be helpful for us? Sure. Uh, what we'd love to do with the whole rest of this session, what do we got now? 26 minutes. Uh, we want to make this about y'all and your questions and anything that you would want to sort of address. And so my humble ask, I'm putting governance in place. Uh, this is not a good time to give us the 10 minute pitch on the fact that you're a video funded startup that has equity given out to all of you people. And you just want to make sure we know about your mission to save the world, if I can snark. Uh, but if you can really concisely just say, problem I'm addressing is this, question I have is that, um, brevity and efficiency so we can honor a lot of questions. Can't tell you how excited we are to hear sort of problem statements and ideas that came out of both the breakouts and anything you'd like to air out with this group. And I'm going to try and do some answering, but I want uh, the model to be that, Dirk, you're walking the chat window. I'm not going to even try and do that. But let's just see if others can share thoughts uh, and make this a peer sharing thing as opposed to in any way all of it needing to route through your hosts. Um, great. And, and I am loving the stuff that's coming in from the small group chat. So that's really, really helpful. And please keep those coming. Um, so just want to invite anyone at this point, uh, you want to come off mute and uh, perhaps ask a question. I have an easy dilemma to start with. This is Rachel. Please. Hi, Hi Rachel. Rachel. Um, how are people, anyone on the call, please help. Um, when you, uh, maybe your home leadership style is facilitative leadership, um, but you are working in groups or with people whose maybe home leadership style is more front of the room. Um, how, how are there tools for bridging? Um, any tips for working in those kinds of situations that people have um, developed? I would be happy to start answering by hopping in, in spite of saying I wanted everyone to talk. Um, let me say two things. I think there are two answers to your question. There's situations you're already in versus situations you're going into. I think one of the beautiful things about facilitative leadership is learning what you need to negotiate before you start the next cycle of leadership. And so if, you're going into a situation, unpacking and negotiating with your fellow stakeholders what exactly they think is the model or the thing that will be how you advance the project. Negotiating upfront shared values around governance, that's helping you to minimize that issue before you get in project. Once you're in project, I think what you're trying to do, there are two, there are two things that you can invoke whenever you're being a facilitated leader that are unassailable. One of my favorite things to do is invoke unassailable things. And it's like, you're not against oxygen, are you? And the two things that I think you can invoke are the outcomes that you are striving for and the collective that you are engaging or facilitating. So if you are trying to get to goal X and someone thinks that you can get to goal X by someone at the front of the room talking, to lovingly posit that getting to that outcome probably requires a more collaborative approach, both because it'll be a higher quality output and because there'll be a greater sense of shared ownership. That kind of negotiation where you're really trying to put the focus on the outcome versus the my way versus your way, because I take it as a foregone conclusion that facilitative leadership done well yields highly superior outcomes. And nothing makes me crazier than someone tells me they're gonna do a strategy planning session where someone gives a presentation and everyone agrees. And I'm like, oh, that's not a strategy planning session. That's something else. And so um, that's one. And then there's the invoking the collective because there's so many ways to invoke the collective. You can say, I don't really think that's good use of everyone's time. 
I don't think that this is really respecting the collective's wisdom and experience by telling them what the strategy should be, but negotiating with your other parties around outcome and around benefit to all stakeholders doesn't solve the problem you're raising, but I think it's a start to some of the ways to chip away at it. And you gotta model it as a long-term negotiation and tie it to benefit. What is the value of doing it the facilitative way? What is the benefit? And if you're talking to funders, what is the impact? What is the impact of taking a facilitative approach as opposed to traditional funder fetishizing expertism approach? Throwing shade at you funders. Love you funders, you fetishize expertism. Stop it. Fetishize collectivism, oh funders. But it's that kind of invoking that helps you negotiate with those other stakeholders. That, Ooh, well, that's thought. That is excellent. Actually, um, I'm, I'm going to be um, uh, do a little facilitative um, and, and forgive me, but um, I want to invite Kate D uh, to come off of mute and ask your question because that is an excellent, excellent question. Hi, yeah, I'm in a shared office, so I have to speak quietly. Um, but yeah, we discussed in our group, and I think this is similar to challenges that lots of people are sharing, like how, how do you overcome the reluctance of participants to have a facilitative leadership style and a participatory interactive style? I mean, I've sometimes found that when I've tried to introduce that kind of dynamic, I've had participants kind of essentially not, not play ball and, and kind of essentially they were expecting to be lectured at by an expert and kind of don't aren't really okay with the, the, the different approach how, so how do we how do we try and overcome that reluctance that sometimes pops up um several answers uh, and it ties back to some of the things i said at the top of the call um i infer from the way you're saying it that there's some amount of they're just finding out when you get in the room did i understand that correctly like they're finding out when they get there oh it's a facilitated thing And I ask because um, I think it's really important, getting back to my point about narrative, good narrative starts from the outcome. Hey, we're going to be getting together at this meeting to really try to accomplish this thing. And to accomplish this thing, we're going to need to do these other things. We're going to need to find out where everybody's at. We're going to really need to compare where we agree and where we don't agree. We're going to need to really get a sense of what needs, being, what needs to be resolved while we're together to do that we'll be following some processes that we believe are the best use of your time and we'll really make sure both all voices are heard, but we actually get to results. Because we don't just want to talk best, we don't just want to listen to one or two people tell us what to think, but we also know that we need to get to some concrete outcomes by the end of the day. Setting up a narrative weeks before that meeting or days, depending on what lead time privilege you have, um, that's important. And then those who know me know that if I'm running any non-trivial meeting, if I'm running a meeting that's any more than about an hour or two long, I engage every single participant in advance. I tell them what the plan is and I ask them if they have any questions or concerns and how I can make sure their time is well spent. So what I am doing is I'm starting individual negotiation with each meeting participant before I get in the room with them to both build a personal relationship, but also to pre-flight anyone who's gonna have issues with this facilitative model. Because there's, I will, let me give you some diagnoses of why people push back on facilitative approaches. There is a fear of having to speak, and that's real, and you want to honor that and be empathetic toward that, but you don't want to let that fear of having to show up undermine an inclusive and equitable approach to producing an outcome. Uh, there are people who will push back on facilitative leadership because it undermines their existing power. I'm really not comfortable with this collaborative stuff. I, I know it might not work. And what they're really saying is, I need to stand up and tell everyone what the answer is, and you're just making noise that's gonna undermine my authority and my ego. And then there are other people where it's just fear of the unknown. Or, and this one just breaks my heart, people who have had bad facilitator experiences before, and I deal with those post-traumatic stress disorder victims all the time. People that were forced to do a trust fall, people that were forced to write on post-it notes for stupid or absolutely purposeless reasons. You know, there's just so much bad facilitation in this world, and part of the passion that Dirk and I share is the passion of saying, let us get out ahead of destructive, irresponsible, ego-driven facilitation. Have you ever been in a situation where someone stands up and opens their cape and says, I'm a facilitator, let me save this moment. The minute someone does that, you should tackle them and put duct tape over their mouth. Okay, that's a little too aggressive, but that's the basic guideline. And so my point is, when you're asking about groups not being receptive to facilitative leadership, first, I would lovingly critique that you probably didn't set expectations in advance of getting in the room. And second, I would say that if you had negotiated with them, found out what their concerns were, and then built refined narrative, said, oh, 
Some of you are survivors of incredibly bad facilitation, and that includes trust falls and really bad post-it note exercises. I hear you. We're not going to do that crap. What I'm here to do is this and this. This has this benefit. This has this benefit. If it sucks at any point, I need to know. I don't need you to suffer in silence. My running joke, don't suffer in silence. That's a pre-social media behavior. You can tweet your dissatisfaction in real time to my face. But you know that kind of narrative that says, I talked to you. You told me you think this is going to suck. It may suck, but I'm doing my best to have it not suck. That's actually real. And people are like, wait, you just sort of acknowledge that you might not be the world's gift to everything. And maybe I should at least feel heard. And maybe I should at least give this a try. And as you move people through that, it's no different than getting people to ride a bike or swim. There's fear, there's reluctance. And as soon as they're rolling along on two wheels or not drowning, you can see them be like, wait, this doesn't suck. Uh, okay, wait, I think I can do this. And boom, we're off to the races. But it gets back to that agency and equity thing. The way that you get buy-in on facilitative approaches is convincing people they have equity in the outcome and agency in real life. Great. And, and you are going to have to forgive me because I, I would love to be opening this up more, um, but uh, we are getting some great questions in. So I want to make sure those keep flowing and coming in. So David, uh, David Apuku, can I get you to come off mute and ask your question, sir? And before David asks his question, David, I'll get right to you in a second. If Sorry. you're not getting a comment in, get aggressive in the chat. Say, yo, Dirk, I really have something to say because I do want voices to be heard. But David, go yeah. ahead. Go ahead, David. Yeah, so my question has to do with the word leader or leadership. Um, from what I have seen, there tends to be an assumption or expectation that a leader is supposed to have that expertise. And I think that yeah. automatically undermines facilitative leadership. So how do you account for that? How do you mitigate that expectation from your audience or even from yourself? That's an excellent question. And it's so spot on. I couldn't agree more. Um, part of it, if you'll pardon a slightly vernacular phrase, part of it is taking the piss out of the word leadership, right? I will often refer to the L word. And so I hang out with a lot of anarchists and uh, self-identified nonconformists. And um, I used to call them libertarians, but that became distasteful. But the point is that a lot of people, um, they see leadership as a bad word. Or to your point, they fetishize it or associate it with expertism. So back to my spirit of negotiating, when you're dealing in a situation, my invitation to you is find out what your stakeholders think leadership is. You can't just assume, but that's why I will put out engagement to people before I meet with them or at the start of a project. I want to find out what they think. And so you don't, you know, you don't always say, what does leadership mean to you? That can seem a little off-putting, a little rhetorical. But you can say, I'll give you a good example. Like if I'm running an open project or if I'm involved in organizing an open project, one of my favorite early conversations is asking people what aspects of governance matter to them the most. And I, I ask it that way. I, like what's good facilitative leadership? Asking people what matters the most to them. What's bad facilitative leadership, or shall I say less effective, is asking people what should be in our governance model. Because if you ask the second question, you're starting a bunch of wars where people are like, everyone needs to touch their nose before talking, and then they need to put their finger in their ear when they're done, just so everybody knows that they're done. And you're like, wow, I really appreciate that suggestion. It will not stay. But if you say, what matters to you, I'm then able to say, thank you for sharing that that matters to you. We understand that matters to you. We may not be able to reflect that in the governance that we bake for this project. But in asking a question like, what matters to you about governance, you start to back out inferences around their assumptions about leadership, around their assumptions about how it is that, uh, that they expect to be led or to be invited to co-lead. And then to keep using the same words over and over again, you're negotiating. But to me, part of facilitative leadership is splitting the following um, difference. And I'm grateful to people like Dirk and Rachel and Beatrice that have been in the room with me a million times. Poor Beatrice, she knows my shtick about it as well as anyone on earth. Um, I have this little thing I do where half the time I'm a voice of authority. I'm like, five minutes, I need everybody back in circle. I don't want to see anybody outside having a cigarette. Five minutes back in here. And the other half of the time, I'm a little bit of a gesture in a court. I'm like, hey, if nobody kills anybody and we actually write some stuff on some post-it notes, maybe something good will happen. And I'm trying to put out a humility that says, I can't control this. I can't tell you how this is gonna come out. I'm just the person with the hands on the steering wheel trying to get this vehicle to a place that we all wanna to go to. And it's in striking that balance in real time, virtually or in person, where what you're doing is subverting stereotypes of leadership. And so acting out subversions of leadership, acting out 
the paradox of leadership because the paradox is important to hold. And what I mean by that is you got to lead. You got to get stuff done. You got to push. You got to tell. But you need to tell after you ask. You need to tell after you listen. You need to tell after you establish that your tell is an amplification of what the group is feeling or doing as opposed to a declaration of what the leader thinks should happen. Hopefully that answers the question. Can I, and, and can I just say, folks, those of you that are using the chat room right now, please keep them coming. Um, we're going to have some fantastic uh, stuff for the, for the blog post after this that you guys are all contributing to. So I'm really, really, really thankful and grateful for you guys putting your thoughts and your questions in there. So please keep them coming um, as they're going. So let me now, uh, another question. Susan Abbott, do you want to come off of mute and ask your question? Just make sure you're here still, Susan Abbott. Oh, oh. I am going to, so uh, I am going to ask Susan's question. Wait, did I get, to, Susan? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, there you oh, go. Oh, great, sorry. Thank you. Um, my question is about in these really wonderful dynamics where people are participating and writing sticky notes and sharing everything that's in their heads, you get a lot of feedback and so much information. It's almost like information overload. How do, mm -hmm. you, how do you bring clarity to it? How do you help people see the most important things or the most interesting things to help kind of keep the meeting going and to evolve the agenda and the flow of conversation um, so that you can work towards outcomes? Mm -hmm. um, that's a great question and I wanna answer it in a relatively wonky way, if you'll indulge me. I'm a recovering software developer. I wrote code for 20 years before I realized that was not my calling. And I believe that you think of agendas or facilitative processes in what programmers call algorithms. And an algorithm is nothing more than a series of steps to generate an outcome or an output. Like a sort algorithm gives you sorted data or a filtering algorithm gives you a subset of the data. And so I believe that you need to know going into a facilitative engagement, what is your process? And we, when we mentor people on facilitation, teach people about a three-step funnel that addresses your question directly. Step one in the funnel is data generation. Step two, in the, and data generation, let's just, keep, let's just keep using this cliche example, people write on Post-it notes, and they just throw those Post-it notes up on a wall, completely unsorted. That's step one of three steps in the funnel. Step two in this data funnel is the sorting and processing and prioritization of the data. And so in a post-it note brainstorm, that's where you say, hey, can we put all the related post-it notes in columns? And can we label those columns? And once we've labeled those columns and all the columns are sorted, can everybody vote on the two individual post-it notes you both want to see looked at in deeper conversations later? And that third step is the actual data analysis, the actual working deeply with the data, where you have that first raw map of everything that's on people's mind. You have the subset of that data, which is the post-it notes people voted for, and that's a very useful subset. And at that point, you have to apply facilitator judgment to turn those high-voted post-it notes and potentially vote post-it notes that didn't get a vote, but that you believe from your strategic perspective need to be incorporated in the dialogue, in particular for equity and inclusion reasons, you then have to, in real time or over time, put together a series of deeper conversations or deeper next steps in a project that get at what has been percolated up. So to summarize, you're right. These processes generate a lot of data. But if you approach what they generate as data processing, if you approach what they generate as algorithmic in trying to take data, sort, filter, and otherwise prioritize data, and then do deep analysis on the high value data, it's not a perfect model, but it's certainly the way that I teach people to think about things. And a final point, you can do all that and still fail badly as a facilitative leader if you don't honor the work done. And so, 
a lot of people do everything I just said, but then after the event, no follow-up. After the event, they don't report out all those post-it notes. After the event, they don't show that those deeper discussions led to outcomes. And so if as a facilitative leader, you want to stay respected as a facilitative leader, it's how you finish the process after the meeting. It's how you honor the work done after the project has completed. It's how you show people that the participatory energy that they invested pays dividends in the long term and was not some gratuitous kumbaya, let's just do fun things together with markers in a room. There needs to be impact and there needs to be higher purpose than just doing the facilitated thing. And if you've done the good work on the data to generate high value outcomes, which could be next steps, action items, decisions, roadmaps, calendars, whatever, if you're acting on that data, you're honoring that facilitated work. Great. Um, we, uh, so Diego, um, I've noticed your question and, and it, it looked like um, it has gotten answered in a number of different ways, both by, by participants in the chat rooms and other ways. So forgive me, um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip, skip you. Um, I, we have two that I definitely want to get to. Kirsty, I know you said you were walking around, so I am going to ask your question for you rather than ask you to come off mute. And Gunnar, just to say, I think this one is a simple one, and then I've got another one which is uh, much longer that we want to get to before the top of the hour um, to warn you. So uh, Christy's question was, how much time does facilitation take? Do you have a rubric for how much work should be done beforehand? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I will jokingly answer that facilitation is a noble gas practice. It will expand to fail available time if you let it. That said, I have some pretty simple multipliers on the processes we run. I think I can't give you a blanket answer because everyone has different methodologies. But what I generally find in the aspiration model is we, find, we usually model a two to one or three to one time prep ratio. So if I'm doing a one day event, it's probably gonna take me about two total days, 16, 20 hours of prep time, maybe three days of prep time. Uh, things that make that range vary, number of participants, complexity of outcomes, uh, mental health of the group. Like I lately have found myself facilitating some very unhappy people. And so when you're facilitating very unhappy people, prep time is much greater because you have to talk to them each individually and go deep and find out what, what it means to them to actually have meaningful outcomes. Whereas if you're in the position, an example of an event that facilitates itself, uh, when I run the Reproducible Builds summits where we talk about how open source software can be mathematically correlated with the code we're running so we can actually trust it, um, that group has such good online collaborative dynamics and so much respect and solidarity that really that the prep time on the Reproducible Builds Summit is really, really well defined because of the fact that I'm not dealing with damage control or group therapy. So it varies widely, but my rubric is two to one or three to one time prep ratio, that ratio also breaks as the meeting link gets shorter. And by that, I mean, if I'm doing a two hour meeting with 20 people, I probably need to spend a little bit more than a two to one ratio to get all that input from all those people. So in a two hour thing, it could be a five to one ratio because it probably takes me eight or 10 hours to get that two hour meeting plan. Great. Um, last question, and I know this is the one that, that uh, we're getting a lot of plus ones um, to get uh, get answered, but Dave Elgasso, um, if you can come off mute and ask your question. Sure, so um, I do a lot of facilitation as well, and I think broadly two different kinds of organizations that I work with, on one end of the spectrum tend to be newer, smaller organizations where maybe this kind of approach is embedded in their DNA from the start. Um, and on the other end, larger organizations, NGOs, UN agencies, let's say, uh, where there might be a small team that's trying to shift the way the organization towards this approach. And I'm, I'm just curious your experience and thoughts on how to move an organization towards this over time, right? What, what impact can one facilitated engagement have on that? And how do you make sure that through this follow-up, you're helping to shift that culture, shift those practices more broadly? And what's realistic to even expect? At what point do you sort of give up and realize the, the, the bureaucracy is too great and let it win and you know, create alternative institutions instead? Yeah, that's a huge question. I love it. Um, so I'll give you an interesting answer that I find is the most powerful answer to your question. I think facilitative leadership in large organizations can be usefully reinterpreted as labor organizing. In other words, I think if you really want to see change in an international NGO or the UN, and we've worked with many of both, um, 
what you're trying to do is empower disempowered people. And by giving them a sense of purpose, by giving them a sense of voice, and by giving them a sense of accomplishment through simple, common sense, facilitated processes like, hey, let's collaborate in a shared document, and let's honor comments, and let's actually try to get a shared document that accurately reflects the inputs of everyone on the team or the committee, that's a life they've almost never lived because of the fact that they live in a bureaucracy-laden, top-down environment. I tend, I was just this morning mentoring someone from a large multinational NGO that shall go unnamed and talking to them about how communications narrative is a subversive labor organizing channel. And I believe that what you want to do is as much bottom up change as top down change. Uh, there's a notion of invisible theater and invisible theater and activist realms is things like teaching people to go into supermarket and have loud conversations in front of the uh, evil, um, product vendor's shelf in the supermarket about how evil the product vendor is. You're like, wow, did you know they exploit their labor and murder chickens in the open? And you just have people have that conversation over and over again in the supermarket to put brand pressure on a brand by having lots of people go to lots of supermarket. I think you can teach people in large organizations a set of talking points. You can co-create a set of talking points that they can then take in the meetings with higher ups so that higher ups are hearing the need for inclusion, the need for transparency, the need for more participatory approaches to things. And then when you're talking to senior leadership, you frame it in terms of opportunity cost, you frame it in terms of professional development, and I just love invoking the I word. Hey, senior leaders at large, bloated, bureaucratic organization, if you care about impact, you better start thinking about ways you can leverage all the brain power in your org because you're trying to solve this in 19th century ways. Last time I checked, this was still the 21st century. So if you really want impact in this world, you should really be thinking about the ways in which you're using participatory, inclusive process, processes, co-creation approaches to design strategy and to design programmatic assets, or you're going to get left behind. The sad, thing I, um, the sad thing I notice is there's just a lot of senior people that don't care. There's a lot of people at the UN who only care about their budget next year being bigger than their budget this year. There's a lot of people at the, at the international NGOs that are strictly focused on holding on to power. And to put it, frankly, we need to mess with those people. We need to teach labor how to organize. We need to teach staff how to subvert power. And we need to teach teams within organizations how to claim back power from senior leadership. Does it always work? Rarely. Senior leadership has too much power and they're often evil. But I think to answer your question that when you're dealing with change in larger institutions, it's a labor organizing remit and it's a subversive approach as opposed to trying to convince the folks at the top that Kumbaya is the new fashion. Great. Um, so, and we are at the top of the hour. One thing I just want to point out though, Julia, uh, your point in there about follow-up um, from event at event is super important. Yes, the two to one point of post event ratio does seem to make sense. Um, I think the big thing is that you need to always make sure that you are not walking away after an event, that you do make sure that there is the plan for follow through, right? And everybody doing that check-in afterwards and making sure that everyone that has agreed to do things are actually doing them and helping, helping that process along. So apologies for, for jumping in and just answering that, but wanted to get that covered before we end the call. And it is now 501. You guys, um, thank you so much for participating. Thanks for all the knowledge shared. I really appreciate yeah, it. Keep typing things into the chat room. I am loving everything I see there. Your, your points have been great and greatly appreciated. Um, just a reminder that we do hold these online discussions monthly. And if you are working on a network-centric resource and want to share your challenges and lessons learned by guesting on one of these, get in touch with me. Um, you should have my email address in your inbox, uh, dirk at fabwriters.net. Also, if you are not part of our network on network-centric resources, you can join at fabwriters.net forward slash network-centric. Gunner, 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 I cannot thank you enough. I uh, really thank appreciate you. That. Thank you all. This is a joy. You can tell I'm passionate about this. We offer free mentoring on this. We're happy to help anytime we can. We've got a wiki that Dirk will send out in the post event email where a lot of our stuff is documented under Creative Commons license. Let us know how we can support you as you try to apply some of what we talked about today. And, and the thing I love about that wiki is that if you can get to it with the URL panelsuck.com. Um, uh, so um, to note, the online discussion will be made available on YouTube and I'll be posting notes 
um, also from all the great stuff that you are putting in the chat room. Uh, <clears throat> um, that'll all be on the Fab Log on the Fab Writers website. Um, as I mentioned before, all of our online discussions are available online as well. Um, our previous guest speakers are all people who have facilitative leadership skills. So you probably want to check those out. And also, again, plug, become one of those people that are part of our guest speaker things and get in touch with me about um, doing one of these in the future. Um, you can also use the Network Centric Resources email list to provide updates on your projects, get challenges addressed, and get your questions answered by peers. Um, I'm going to hit the stop record, but um, I'll be sticking around if you have any network centric resources related or anything else from the call you want to riff on a little bit with me. Um, but for those of you that got to run, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Thank you, everybody.